morning, folks. Yeah, it is a wonderful Sunday, uh, March 29th, and given some of the things that have been going on lately with respect to some flu-like virus that's running around, you know, we've had some time to dress up the shop. You know, we've added a monitor to the front of the store, big 40 inch or so, you know, so we can watch our videos. Yeah, and we did some cleaning that probably hasn't been done for 20 years in some areas here. Yeah, so we've made good use of the time. And one thing I've wanted to do for a long time, yeah, is to do a little you know, intro video for long range style fishing for folks. You know, that certainly has been a core part of what we do you know, for the last 20 plus years. You know, and it's a unique situation that we have with the boats out of San Diego when hopefully everybody is safe and we get through this little spell and the boats are operating again right now. For the most part, they're not, you know, given the virus that's floating around. But, you know, I, I really don't want to waste time on that type of silliness you know, at this point in time because this is, we fish because we love to and it also is a major distraction from our regular day-to-day -day lives you know, for a lot of us it's where we charge our batteries up so we can go back and do it again you know, for others you know, it's it's something it's an opportunity that arrives you know in our later years when we have the time and we have some money that we can put to it you know and for some of us you know you know, long range trips are something we plan for a couple of years in advance, you know, and save up the money and then are able to go do them. You know, I know a lot of fellas in that position, you know, that are older, retired, fixed income, but it's still their passion. You know, and maybe they didn't set aside so much money as to be able to just, you know, okay, I'm going to get on the boat for eight days. You know, but, you know, they have that love and they budget it and they're able to do it. And, Really, when we do the math on these type of trips, you know, they're, they're even as expensive as they are, there's still a wonderful value out there. You know, when you consider the price of a long range trip, let's say, you know, uh, even, even a five day or uh, if it were to cost as much as $2,000, figure you've got accommodations you know, for five nights, you've got three meals plus a serious snack, you know, and maybe more <laughs> every day. You know, you've got the service of experienced deckhands and skippers, you know, you've got bait, you've got a lot of things that go into it, you know, and when you look at it per day per dollar, these trips are not bad, you know, they are, I'll say they're a value, you know, even as expensive as they are, you know, when you put them in the context of any other vacation, and what other vacation can you go on, you know, and pursue a hobby, you know, and catch fish, you know, you know come back with something, it's a wonderful thing, you know, so, you know, big into that, you know, before I could afford to be a, a long ranger, I was a private boater, you know, that carries a whole different set of, uh, of skills and, and needs and, and, you know, places to put dollars, but, you know, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what folks can expect on a long range trip, you know, and we have to break these down into a few different types of trips. If we go over 10 days, let's say 12 days, 16 days, a fly down, fly back out of Cabo with it sitting, you know, with Hurricane Bank or something like that, those long trips are typically cow tuna focused. Now, may have an opportunity to do some other things, but the intent is, you know, putting people in a position where they can pull on a tuna that's over 200 pounds. You know, that's the goal of those trips, and that's what the anglers expect. But what, what about? those of us to get on a boat for oh say three to five days or six to eight days what do we expect on those trips well I have to say those are my favorite trips you know on, on a four or five day trip and an eight day trip that's bread and butter you know that's that's the good stuff for me because those are typically variety trips so let's break it down a little bit more on what the expectations are when we get dealing with trips of, of that sort of length of time. On a, on a three to five day trip, I'm gonna preface this a little bit. Why would you go eight days if you can catch similar fish on a three to five? 
or even you know say a six-day trip you can do five-day trip we can go to Guadalupe in the old days I used to be able to do a Guadalupe trip on four days and fish Cedros or Benitos we'd do that we'd get the gobwebs out then we'd go to Guadalupe for a day and a half catch some bigger gray tuna then head on back home that option is out right now because Mexico is, has made Guadalupe uh, uh, more of an ecotourism type of zone and the boats have to spend some time first and check in Ensenada, check out of Ensenada on the way back uh, and going home. So we lose, you know, three quarters of a day, you know, certainly a half a day you know, with those two stops if everything goes according to plan. The longer trips give you more options. That's the reason. You know, more options and more opportunities you know, on the fish. So three to five days, typically we're looking at uh, tuna and yellowtail you know, for the catches. May get some Dorado, but tuna and yellowtail become the primary. And when we stretch that to eight days, well still, tuna and yellowtail are in the offing, but we also pick up the opportunity typically of catching some wahoo. And wahoo, oh no, that's a big prize. You know, that's, that's, that's something that a lot of guys enjoy because they're so doggone excited to catch. And Dorado, you know, you know, with more days we have more opportunities to find that, that you know, ripe school of Dorado, you know, which again is another thing that just you know, makes the boat go a little crazy for a while, just like Wahoo will make the boat go crazy. So the longer the trip, the more opportunities and perhaps bigger fish, perhaps can't say that right now because we've had this with this wonderful resource of local bluefin tuna in that two to three hundred pound range off of San Clemente Island. So there are times the boats will, you know, turn right instead of turning left, especially if it's a, you know, three, four or five day trip. That may be the best option. And when we think about destinations, don't get too hung up on that when you're planning your long range trips. You know, even though it might be a trip that you know typically goes to Guadalupe or goes to Alejos Rocks, the skipper is going to want to point the boat where the opportunities are the best. So you know, when you get on the boat, get on with an open mind about where the destination is going to go. You know, the skipper, you know, their intent is to have everybody have success, and they're going to try and stack the deck in your favor to the best of their ability and the best of the timing you know, in, in that year you, know, you can provide. So relax, don't get too focused. So now we're on a three to five day trip, and we're going to be catching yellowtail and hopefully schooly tuna. So what do people use? Well, one of the big benefits on these long range boats is their bait holding capability and the big boats have big slammers to put the bait in, you know, big live wells for the things to swim around and stay healthy and the longer range boats get the best priority as far as the bait so typically their baits are cured more, they're going to be a little more lively, they're going to hold up better on the, on the, the trip down south if they're making a long run, you know, better quality. So what's this bait fishing? You know, I've had some guys that have flown in from Florida or, or East Coast, and this whole bait fishing thing is kind of new. They are great <laughs> with fishing artificials. Could be poppers, could be jigs, iron, you know, whatever. But this bait thing may take a little while to dial in. Ain't that hard. You know, you know the thing is you want to catch that bait. You want to use the bait that's the hardest one to catch in a live well. And typically what we're using, you know, when we start working with live bait will be circle hooks. You know, this would be an example from Click Rig. You know, Mustad has some wonderful circles. You know, you know, that's, that would be a J hook from owner and some guys will use the J's. But the circles are, are becoming increasingly popular for good reason. You know, with the circle hook, and these are some heavier Mustads, you know, there's a range. Eagle Claw makes some dandy hooks in that respect. You know, a lot of them are, are you know, good size, you know, it's pretty big, but typically we go with a circle, you know. And the benefit with a circle hook is when the fish takes that hook, or takes the bait, and what's going to happen is they pull away, that hook is going to embed in the side of the you know, jaw, you know, and so we get a nice hook in the fish's jaw, hard you know, material there, cartilage, it doesn't pull out very easily. But it's easier for you to release that fish later, you know, by pulling the hook out and putting the fish back on the water. Uh, so if you're going to, you know, get, practice catch and release, 
the use of circle hooks is something that's become becoming mandated throughout the country, you know, in different fisheries, you know, just because it makes that you know, easier process, less apt for that fish to swallow the hook into the gut, more apt as the fish moves away, it's going to be right in the corner of the mouth. And that's the best place to sink a hook you know, for these fish. So we're going to use circle hooks nine times out of ten. The circle hook, the way you fish a circle hook is you'll have your line out and the bait swimming around, swim, 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 you know. And when you notice that the bait has been picked up, you go ahead and point your rod at the fish, engage your lever if it's a lever drag or engage the reel if it's a star drag. So now it's pulling drag. As that fish moves away with the rod still pointed at the fish, you're not doing any high sticking type of stuff, just let it point and then engage it, and typically that fish's momentum swimming away is what's going to set the hook. It's a wonderful way to go uh, on those fish. Now where do you hook a bait? And this is not what we typically use. It looks more like a trout than it does a sardine. But there are a few places we hook them. One, we'll drive that hook in the nose of the sardine. So eh, through that section right there. That's one place people will put a hook. And let's see, let me grab a hook out of here so I can show you what typically can happen. The good thing about a nose hook bait is that you get two opportunities to fish it. So I've got my hook in, and again, this is way oversized and not the way to want to do it. But let's say this is where we've got that sucker. And what can happen is we're fishing this thing, and this again, oversized on the hook. But what can happen, it can get smacked. Let's talk about the good thing first. I'll come back to the bed. On the good, we cast the thing on out. Again, the livelier the bait, <clears throat> the better the effect of your casting will be. Because even if you're challenged in casting, a good lively bait's going to swim out. You want to have the wind in your face, okay? Wind in your face, that's telling you typically the boat's going to be on a drift. So the bait's going to be moving out from the boat because of the drift as well. The bait's going to want to be swimming into the current. So that bait, as it goes out, you have an opportunity to get bit. And let's say it's gone out now for a couple hundred yards and nothing's happened. You want to bring it back in. And so you can slowly bring that bait back to you and you have another opportunity to get bit. Those are the good times. And I've been, I've been bit both ways, going out and coming back or as soon as it splashes in the water. Uh, but you can get bit on that retrieve. Take your time and bring it in. That's with a nose hook. Downside, a tuna can come around and slam this sucker, and now this hook is embedded in the back of the bait. And useless. Yeah, it's not going to get you anywhere. Even if the bait's out there and you feel it frisky, when the hook gets slammed like that, it's no good. So that doesn't work very well. You know, that's the downsize, downside on a nose hooked bait. Other ways to hook a bait. We can go for a belly hook. Basically through the belly. So behind that fin, and now we've got a belly hook. And what happens here, that bait's going to want to go down. <clears throat> okay, so if the, if the bigger fish are underneath, the little schooly guys, these little schooly guys are going to come up first to try and grab stuff. The bigger fish will be underneath that. Opportunistic, but not dumb. You know, that will allow that bait to get down to that zone on a belly hook. The other things that guys do, they might do a back hook as well, back in the back part of the fin behind uh, the caudal fin here. And again, that's typically going to be, you know, maybe it's going to be a little more up on the surface than it would be with a, with a belly hook, you know, but it still is going to swim down, swim away from you. And then the other way to hook it is to go for a shoulder hook. And a shoulder hook on a big bait is a really good thing. And on a finicky, uh, say a bluefin tuna, that's pretty skittish, using their eyes a lot, this back hook can be a good thing because they're looking at it from up above, looking up. And at that point, they're not seeing the hook. So especially if you downsize that hook, not a big six out like that, but you're using maybe a one you know, maybe even a number one, you know, a small hook you know, on the bait can be really, really stealthy and a great way to present it. And again, as long as that bait's moving and you have line contact with the bait, you're not just stripping out line. You've got things, you know, you, you can feel that thing moving you're going to feel the bite. The guys that get in trouble are the ones that just, okay, I'm putting the line, uh, putting the line out. Okay, I never get bit. Doggone it, the bait fell off the hook. Now, tries it again, doesn't maintain contact. 
What the heck? I never get bit. Everybody else is getting bit. They bring back the line. There's no bait on the hook. What the heck? You've got to maintain that tension. Not heavy resistance because we're not trying to tire the bait out. But we want to know that it's doing its job. And when it stops doing its job, it's time to get a new bait. If you're in the middle of a, of a good bite and other people are getting bitten, you're not. Look to yourself. You know, don't blame the bait. Blame what you're doing. You know, then go from there. And then correct. So we can anticipate bait fishing. Do you ever use a uh, weight with that way? Sometimes. It depends on the conditions. Um, there are times where you use a uh, real small egg sinker like that, and you'll put that on the line, maybe with a Carolina keep, Keeper, maybe without. Let that thing slide. Maybe we'll go even heavier uh, if the need is because of current you know, wind conditions. You know, in that case, you may have to go with a little heavier sinker, and you want to get that bait down. You know, to where the fish are going to be active if they're not coming up to the surface. So that can be helpful. You know, I rarely will go to that level. I'll tend to wind up using jigs and some other things at that point. But it can be real effective. It can be real effective. The other thing that we do you know, would be dropper loop fishing you know, with bait. And on that, I'm not going to uh, break out a rig here. When you get on the big boats, typically you get instruction from the skipper. You know, the first could be when you're leaving the harbor, could be the first day, you know, you know, if it's a travel day, you know, and the skipper will go through everything. You know. We've got some videos I did last year showing Roy, Roy Rose, you know, showing Andy Cates, you know, going through their little captain spiel, you know, getting people set up for the you know, fishing activity ahead. If it's dropper loop fishing, typically we'll use a torpedo you know, sinker, and it's got rings on both ends. You know, and we'll tie that to the bottom, and then we'll have a loop of line. We'll put the hook on that loop. That could be separated by maybe 18 inches, 24 inches, something like that. The intent is, brings the bait down. We've got the bait going off on the side. Current's keeping the bait where it belongs to. The bait's oriented, you know, facing you know, uh, the current. And if there's a yellowtail that's hunkered down on structure, you can get some really, really nice yellowtail that way. But be prepared. Once you get picked up, you know, you're on you know, on those things. You know, might be a grouper. You know, and, and both of those are things that we can run into you know, fishing you know, in the same waters. You know, where that yellowtail might be congregated would also be the point where you may see some grouper. You know. Now, sometimes the yellowtail come up, and that that's, brings up a different type of bite. That's where we're going to be more on iron. Now, when we talk about fishing iron on these three to five day trips, and you can add to that if we start doing, you know, longer trips, because typically we'll do, we'll have some opportunities. But when we're fishing iron, this is typically what we're talking about. That would be a Salus 6X and a 6X Junior. You know, Taddy also has lures like these, and those are really, really effective for yellowtail. You know, these are old school West Coast irons. They've been around for a long time. In the case of Salus, I think this is the third generation of making these things. It could even be the fourth you know, for that family. And that's, you know, Matt Salus could be doing other things with his life, but he's, he's kept this going. You know, still made the same way, still made in the U.S. They're not coming from China or anywhere else. You know, he, he casts these himself. He's his own foundry. You know, and... The fellow that has worked for him has done so for probably 30 years plus, and I think worked for his dad prior to that. You know, so it's a neat family business. We like family businesses. Chart baits a family business. So in even iron, real popular, and there are other ways of doing things. But on those three to five day trips, you're going to spend time on bait. You're going to spend time probably fishing some iron. Now we go a little bit longer on the trips, and now we have that opportunity for Wahoo. Now what about, before I get there, what about trolling on the three to fives? These days, on the long range boats, you know, as a tackle owner, tackle store owner, maybe I don't necessarily like this program, but a lot of the boats uh, have their own trolling gear. You know, now that gear can be good, okay, or very good. Depends on the boat and depends when the last time they had the gear serviced. You know, Certainly, no boat gear is going to be as good as your own, you know, as far as it's, you know, being taken care of and, and being ready to go. You know, if you have the opportunity of having your own gear, that's great. You know, but if you don't have your own trolling gear, the boats will provide that. You know, 
So that simplifies you know, your gear selection a lot because it's real easy to tie up $1,000 on a, on a troll rig. Now we can do other things with that rig, but typically a troll rig is going to have longer leader. You know, it could be 100 yards on there because it gives us some stretch and we want that on the troll versus a bait rig that may be as little as say 25 feet or less even for some guys you know, and very little to no stretch. You know, so when it comes to trolling, you know, anticipate that. I will still say even if you're going to use the boat's gear, it's nice to have your own trolling lures. You know, it can make a difference uh, as far as what the fish will see. And if we're trolling for tuna, you know, there you can use feathers. This would be a, a catchy tackle spinner jet. You know, they've got a wonderful little spinner on them, you know, so they turn up the water well. Uh, Dodo Dorado like them, you know, tuna like them. You know, Wahoo likes them too, as far as that goes. And they have some that are made for Wahoo, or you could you know wire them up. But for tuna, real effective lures. Uh, same with the zucker, the zucker feathers, the grass skirts, stuff like that. Great, you know, just really, really great stuff to use. Yeah, um, yeah. On most of these trips, we will troll to locate fish. Uh, and once you find, you know, those fish that are biters, that's when we go into bait mode, you know, jig mode, iron mode, whatever. You know, once we find them. Now. Eight day type trips, you know, when we graduate. Now we bring in the potential for Wahoo. And with Wahoo, again, the skipper is going to give you some of the rules of the road. You know, but I'll, I'll say that more fishermen are probably injured from Wahoo than any other fish. And most of those injuries occur after the fish is dead. You know, guys don't think about it, they'll put their finger in the fish's mouth. And a Wahoo, the teeth are not big, but my gosh, they're, they're a lot of them and they're razor sharp. You know, and it's a hard beak on that thing. So it's real easy to have a problem. Now, very acrobatic fish too. There are many you know, examples over the years of boats that have flown out of the water into, uh, you know, the, into the boat where there are fishermen, even through uh, the window in the galley. You know, there have been examples of that. You know, so there are some caveats in the way you know, you treat your lure if you are fishing bombs and jigs and that sort of thing as far as not just winding it and bringing the thing right into the boat. You give it a pause you know, at, you know, the water line and then bring it in, you know, you know just to, to hopefully keep that wahoo from chasing it all the way out over the rail, yeah, you know, and, and getting you, you know, or someone else, you know. What do we fish for wahoo? Well, lots of stuff. We can fish bombs, these are a couple of bombs, casting bombs, we can fish iron, this would be a sea strike from Ketchy, you know, salus, you know, a single hook typically is where we will go when it comes time for Wahoo. Cast and retrieve, you know, in that case. And again, we're going to use, we are going to use you know, trolling lures to, to locate fish. And in the world of trolling lures, you've got a couple of different styles. Yeah. We have our planing head type of lures where the head being kind of flat and where the orientation of the hook of the line is, we're going to attain depth. This is also weighted. Or it'll have a large bill like a DTX minnow. Different trolling positions, different lures will track better. Yeah. So it's good if you're you know when you bring your own gear, have a couple of different styles. Now this is a big 26 ounce catchy jet, kind of rare lures really, but very effective on the Wahoo. Now again, this is going to be, even though it's heavy, it'll be subsurface, but it'll be oriented more towards the surface where a build lure like that DTX, that's going to be diving hard. You know, not as easy to bring in either on a moving boat, you know, but that is very effective as are the planing type lures and the jets can be. You know, so. You know, we'll locate the fish and it's all hands on deck, fish and iron, bombs, you know, and bait. And on the case of, in the case of Wahoo, on bait fishing, typically we're going to be using 40 to 50 pound you know, single strand of wire. If it's real picky, you might even drop down to 27 pound wire. But when you do that and make those choices you know, on that wire, note that it's 27 pounds but that doesn't mean it's going to deal with 27 pounds worth of drag pressure because 
when we are fishing, you've got two forces that, that get applied. You know, one is the drag from your reel, and the other is the force of the fish swimming away. And so it's a force multiplier. So you can get up there to the breaking point you know, very, very easily. And there's a reason why we typically say set your drag 25, 30%, 33% of whatever the line test is. You need to, you know, because if you don't, you're going to break off and you're going to blame the line, you're going to blame this, going to blame that. No, you blame yourself because the drag was set too damn heavy. You know, that's all there is to it. I, I never want to hear somebody say, oh, I lost your line, it broke. No, if your line's in good shape, it hasn't been out, and it hasn't been nicked or cut or anything like that. If, if you have a break off on a fish, it typically is your own damn fault. Yeah, um, and so you need to, you know, set your drag, especially on the trolling pieces, set it effect, you know, to, to the right level. And if you're fishing bombs, I'll never forget one charter, uh, Bob Cherry, Wahoo Bob's on the boat. And he's really schooling the whole, everybody on the boat. He's schooling them on how to catch Wahoo. It was not an easy Wahoo bite. And they were not taking jigs, were not taking iron. You know, I think we only had one jig fish, that was maybe the first day. After that, they just weren't touching that stuff. You had to fish bait. And it, they'd seen a lot of, of pressure, you know, this group of, of fish, but that's, those were where the biters were, that's where the best opportunity was. Bob scaled down to 27 pounds on the wire, and he dropped his drag level down to eight pounds, very specific, it's set for eight pounds. Well, he gets hooked up, and he's taking his time getting the fish in. Of course, take too much time, and the deckhands are figuring, oh my gosh, we're gonna lose it. And, and so the deck come, Dickie comes over to try and help Bob, and, and Bob's trying to get around somebody, and so the Dickie, you know, is starting to fiddle with the drag, and Bob says, hold it, stop, you know. I know what I'm doing, it's set for eight pounds. I've got 27 pound wire, don't screw with it. Well, Bob's right as rain, you know, because if it had been advanced, sure enough, the thing would have broken. You know, and I can revisit this a couple years later, I'm fishing with some guys, they came by our shop, they picked up some pre-rigged hook rigs, and we have them here, 65, 44, 27 pound. You know, Sergey makes those up, does a beautiful job with them. You know, well, the fellow said, I, I, I broke off on a wire. I got bit. I, I broke off. Uh, I think those wires, you know, that wire's no good, Mark. And I look at it and said, that's a 27 pound wire. What's your drag set at? I don't know. Well, shoot. If you don't know what the drag set out and you're set at, and you're fishing, you know, a reel that's capable of doing, say, 20 pounds worth of drag, and you have it set like you would for, you know, fishing 50 pound line, that's too doggone heavy. You know, you've got your drag probably set 15, 18 pounds, something like that. You know, well, that 27 pound wire isn't going to deal with that. It's not going to deal with 15 pounds worth of drag. It needs eight pounds worth of drag. Set your drag at a third. You know, it is a max of whatever the line test is you're fishing. Whatever the weakest line is that you're fishing. Okay, so what do we have? Three to five day trips. You probably will need, um, you might have a 20 pound rig, but more often than not, I'll bring along a 30 that I could drop down with some fluorocarbon leader you know, if I wanted to, you know, but I'll bring some 30. I will absolutely have 40. And I might have something 50, 60 pounds for dropper loop fishing on a three to five. Would it be nice to have something heavier? Yeah, it'd be nice to have something maybe more in that 60 to 80 pound along with, especially with these big blue fin. But with the two speed gear these days, the stuff is so much more versatile now than it used to be. It used to be on an eight day trip, you'd take your tuna stuff, you'd take your Wahoo stuff, rods and reels for each one. These days, I may scale down to three or four reels at most, even on an eight-day trip. You know, but certainly on a, on a three to five, I'll have 30-pound covered, I'll have 40-pound covered, and if I have something that can fish 50 and 60, I'll bring that along. And those three rigs will be 100% of what I'm going to use. You know, for most people, having something to fish 40 on, if there's only one rig to have on a long-range trip, say, you know, four or five days, eight days, if there's only one rig you're gonna, you're gonna buy and everything else you're gonna try and rent, make it a good 40 pound outfit that you can you know, work with and get used to working with that. You know, you know, a seven foot rod, an eight foot rod's a nice thing, could be harder to transport. You don't have quite the leverage, but you've got more casting distance potential out of an eight footer than you would for a seven. Those are your basic bread and butter rigs. And that'll be the same, you know, 30, 
40, 50, 60. That will be the same when we get into an eight day trip. But on an eight day trip, you can justify doubling up in that 40 and 50 pound range. That way you can have one rigged up set up for bait, one for iron, potentially one for a bomb. You may have all three opportunities going on in a very short period of time. And so having flexibility of the gear at the rail, big help. You know, it's a really big help. And then if there's going to be that opportunity to do some dropper loop fishing, potentially for a grouper, which is great fun, you know, if you can get a grouper, that's that's neat stuff and potentially good sized fish and great eating. Now, there we want to have something that's probably 60, 80 pounds, you know, very easily, you know, and that's going to be a dropper loop type, type of rig, you know, in that application. Now that may also be something you'd use for fly lining, you know, a bait if we're into the bigger tuna. So it's good to justify having a heavier, you know, 60, 80 pound outfit to complement the rest of the gear you have. Well, where do we get into this 100 and 130 pound stuff? Well, we do that when we have the expectation of cow size tuna. You know, can we get to that on an eight day trip? Oh, absolutely. You know, we hit one of those um, 2005 you know, on the Red Rooster. We were one of the first boats to get on the School of Fish you know, outside of Meg Bay. And we had, oh geez, we had over 20 fish that were over 200 pounds. I think the big fish was 303. Um, we had another uh, five dayer, uh, no, excuse me, uh, we had another eight dayer a couple of years later. Big fish was again in the upper 280s. Um, you know, with the blue fin around, we got a 306 on one of the trips. I think it was coming back on a five dayer. Um, so these, you know, opportunities do exist out there you know, you know, on the shorter trips, but certainly on the, on the long trips. You know, the last thing, you know, and sometimes we hear of somebody who's planned to make one of these long trips, but doesn't have any gear for it. And so they're planning on renting everything. You know, I mean, you're going to blow three grand or so on a trip. It's nice to have your own gear and give that some thought too, and not be dependent upon the rental stuff. You know, if that's your only you know avenue, take advantage of it. Some of the boats have pretty good gear. I know the Rooster has. Uh, Okuma is tied in with them, so you've got some Okuma uh, reels available. Even on the troll side, typically it's going to be the Macairas. Used to be Avits on that boat. Uh, they made the shift, oh, six, eight years ago uh, to the Okuma product. Um, you know, Avits still do well, uh, but you know, Okuma was trying to work with it and get their pieces out more. And so they were pretty you know, lenient and, and helpful uh, in putting the gear on the boats for the rooster. Yeah, and other boats, you know, some other boats may tie in with somebody else or have some other gear to work with. Yeah, it's helpful, you know, and it does expose people uh, to the gear. So, but what I'm saying is you don't have to have a ton of gear. If you have that piece that can fish 30, a piece that can fish 40 and 50, you know, and something that's going to be able to fish, say, 60, you know, you're pretty well covered. 60 to 80, great, you know, 40 and 50, great, and maybe something lighter that hopefully you don't have to use or maybe you just use a make and bait. You know, that'll do you just just fine. You know, so that's the routine. You know, these trips aren't that hard uh, to get geared up for. You know, there's nothing too mysterious. And you have the opportunity of learning from people that, that have done it a lot. You, know, you really get on a wonderful learning curve you know, on these trips. And typically as the length goes up, you know, the, the courtesy factor improves because everyone knows they're going to have a shot at the fish. You know, they're going to have their time at the rail. And everybody has to eat. So even if the boat has you know, over 30 people on it, you know, people have to have lunch too. So you're going to have time where that rail is, is flat out empty. And then nighttime, you know, most of these guys wind up going to bed you know, unless the skipper has other plans. Other plans? Ah, I got to bring it up. Okay, other plans. Well, first and foremost, <laughs> it's making bait. This is something we just love to have the captains tell us. Hey guys, we gotta go make bait. Yeah, uh, you know, come on out about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. We gotta make bait. You wanna fish bait in the morning? You gotta make bait tonight. Oh geez, we're tired, been fishing all day. I gotta go out and make stinking bait. Yes, you do. Do not plan on using bait if you're not out there making bait. So what do you need to make bait? You need some sabikis. Bring along two or three sabikis, even on an eight-day trip. You're probably going to make bait 
three nights on, a, on an eight day or maybe two. Maybe the skipper is kind and he feels sorry for you and you only do it once. Chances are you're going to have to make bait, you know, especially if you're going through a lot. Standard little sabiki small hooks and that's great for catching small stuff. Um, often what we wind up doing is are the little uh, squid imitations, uh, two hook, four hook. You know, routines two hook you know bigger bait you know, something like this you've got probably a half dozen hooks on there that gets pretty squirrely if you're getting a bunch of mackerel on you know, making bait is something to anticipate doing because people fish bait i mentioned you know iron fishing i fit you know a few other things don't be afraid to play with some artificials you know on the dropper loop at night time especially oh dear i would be running a few things let's see here. one these escalites, I don't know if you can see it very well. Doggone things do help getting bit at night. You know, it's a wonderful little attractor. You know, it flashes or glows, you know, mimics you know, natural bioluminescence out there. Squid imitations, very, very nice. You know, these are from Savage Gear. You know, this is a little chase baits. You can use things like that on a dropper loop and they can be very effective. You know, nighttime, pretty simple. Bait works too, you know, and things like that. Do dandy, same with a little octopus. Um, you know, on these big trips, I've seen a few when we come back in. We've had our time on the ridge. We've had to check back in in Sonata, uh, and we've got a little bit of time to kill. Um, not unusual for the boats to stop off and say, you know, let's give a, a whack at catching some um, good quality rockfish and possibly lean cod or maybe halibut. And so they'll do another type of fishing you know, instead of you know, open water stuff or, or hitting a destination like the ridge or the rocks. They'll go ahead and fish some of these banks, some of these rocky spots you know, for some other fish. Great eating fish and don't turn your nose up at it. You know, again, it's part of that experience. And there we can do some of this other stuff. You, know, you may even want to bring along a, a, you know, a couple hook or a multi-hook ganglion you know, just in case. You know. On, on, I think I, I went over it, but on the torpedo sinkers, you know, good to have a range of weights, you know, maybe even up to as heavy as 24 ounces, uh, depending upon current. Again, longer trip, you know, it, maybe you make more use of it, but I, I would have it with me on a three to fiver as well. Nighttime fishing, typically you're gonna play dropper loop. And if it's open water, now it's a chance to get down for sorties and you've gotta have enough weight to get some depth. You know, so you, know, you wanna have that flexibility. You know, when you go on these trips, it's not necessarily a show and tell as far as bringing everything, you know, but the kitchen sink. But you get the idea that there are a number of different things we do. You know, and so having a range of, of stuff with you is a good idea. You know, I tend to travel pretty light because I know really what, I'm, what my plan is you know, with the time I've got. You know, and I'll encourage you to do the same. You know, you know, was on the uh, Royal Polaris this past year. I hadn't fished. Jeff Du Bois um, used to be on the rooster when I was first doing the long range trips, 2002, three, I guess. You know, I, and Jeff used to be there. I hadn't fished with him. He, he switched off the Indy, you know, and now he's with the Royal Polaris fishing you know, with Roy you know, there. And Jeff came up to me, and you know, I was happy to see him. I hadn't fished with a guy for you know, over a decade. You know, he said, Mark, you know, I want to compliment you. The one thing, you know, you know, a lot of different guys get on the boats. They get the gear from a lot of places. But, you know, when the guys shop with your store, they come with the right stuff. They don't get, they're not loaded down with a bunch of crap they'll never fish. You know, that was a nice compliment. You know, we don't try and encourage people to get... You know, it's a one-time shot, I'd better tap into you right now or else I'll never see you again, so I better make all I can. It doesn't work that way. Uh, our, our clients, you know, we get to fish vicariously all over the world you know, with people. You know, and, you know, we were setting up, as I would be setting up a friend, the same information, same stuff. You know, I'm setting up a friend to go fishing or I'm setting myself up to go fishing or setting up somebody that's never contacted us before, never bought a doggone thing from us. You know, we'll approach it the same way. You know, we want you to be successful. We want you to use the gear you take with you. 
Now, does that mean you can return everything you don't use? Hell no. I've had a couple of people try and do that. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you buy gear for a trip, whether you use it or not, that's based on the trip. You don't this time, you will next time. But we're not going to sadly with a bunch of crap you don't need. You know, and there are places that certainly have a reputation of doing that. And it was nice that Jeff recognized that we do try and provide good advice to folks. You know, I will say one thing we are seeing um, on these long range boats, we, we are seeing some guys that are kind of going outside the comfort level. You know, and I think part of that's because we've got people that, that come in from all over the world you know, on these trips and they come in with different skill sets. And so the typical West Coast long range angler that's been doing this for 30 years, you know, they're used to fishing West Coast, iron, West Coast iron, Wahoo bombs, and stuff like that, and bait. These guys that come from other areas, maybe they're more used to fishing artificials because they don't have the, the crutch or, uh, of having a live bait to fish. You know? And so they do a lot of artificials, whether that's a swimming lure or it's poppers. You know, Those things are doggone effective and can be an awful lot of fun, especially after you've taken a few fish on bait. You, know, you may really want to you know, catch the dumb ones and have it be your work that, that gets them on the hook instead of the bait's work. You know, you know, so having some stuff like that with you is is a good thing. Having some, you know, even some slow pitch jigs, you know, can be a good thing. You know, on on especially with schoolie fish, you know, but you don't need too much. You need to have a variety you know, of the right type of gear. That's and that and the gear needs to be kind of focused or, or you know, focused towards the type of fishing that we would anticipate you doing on a particular fish, a particular trip, at a particular time of year. You know, and if we know when you're going and we know what boat you're on, we have a pretty good feel you know, for what you know, you're going to want to use. But in general, it's pretty simple. If you had nothing at all and you just were going to plunk bait, that's supplied on the boat. But bring along a sabiki because you're using a lot of bait and damn it, you better catch your own. Because um, I don't want to be <clears throat> losing my sleep just to catch bait for you. You know, everybody needs to be doing it. So in any event, much, much too much to talk about. Uh, I covered too many different things. I just want to demystify. Um, it's not rocket science. You know, this is easy stuff. You know, the skipper is going to put you on the fish. The deckhands are going to help you. You know, when you need the help, they're going to have bait. You know, you need to just come with some enthusiasm uh, and and your passion towards fishing. Yeah, I will. I'm going to close out, but before doing so. Two little things. You know, I mentioned before, have some sunscreen. This stuff, the soul stuff, I love. You know, yeah, I, there's another video of me putting the stuff in my eye. It, it's not going to blind you. And you put it on once and you're good for the day. You know, it doesn't break down in water. Have a good sunscreen. You know, have a Kindle, bring a book. This can be your opportunity to do some reading that you've wanted to do and you don't have the opportunity. For me, that always is. You know, I get to read when I'm on the boat and typically I don't get time to do much reading uh, you know, yeah, when I'm not on the boat. <laughs> so it's, it's a great opportunity to relax a little bit. You know, you pick your shots, fish when you feel like fishing, eat when you feel like eating. Um, it's okay to skip a meal. I'll usually do two meals a day, not three. You know, unless the food's really, really good. So, okay, so usually I get three. But every once in a while, I'll try and skip a meal just so I can tell my wife I did. You know, just be prepared to have one hell of a time and some memories. That's about it, folks. Go fishing. Thanks for watching. Mark out. I go down because you're signing up early for these charters. You know, there's you know, etiquette that goes along with this, you know, too, as far as where you put your gear, all that sort of stuff. But it's it's a good thing. The last thing I want to mention is tipping. You know, and it's not my job to talk about it, but I will, you know, because that's another expense. Just like fish processing. What do you do with all the fish when you come home? Well, doggone it, there are places that will take care of that for you. And they'll meet you right at the dock, and they will process the fish. They'll vacuum seal it. They'll, they want it smoked. Uh, you want it turned into jerky. They'll do all that stuff for you for a price. If you're flying in from the East Coast, they will fly that fish back to you, you know, and it'll be prime, absolutely prime, in the right type of freezer bags that'll last for over a year and be fresh. And let's go back to tipping. 
like anything else, it's like going to a restaurant. You know, the deckhands, skipper, their income, you know, off the top may not be that great per hour. Oh my God, I wouldn't want to put it in an hourly basis. It would be god awful terrible. But let's say it's a minimum wage situation, and for the most part, it can be, as a deckhand. Where does the income come from? Because these guys are on the water for could be a month at a time, you know, different loads, different people. It comes from the tips, okay? And a tip is for services rendered. If you were on a trip and the service absolutely sucked, there was no deckhand to help you, nobody was helping gaff a fish, they were rude, crude, and obnoxious, okay, I understand not giving a tip in that case or making it a very small tip because I guarantee you not everybody on the boat is that way and the tips are shared among the crew. 15% is an average. 10 to 20 percent, 10 percent being the low end, 20 percent being, you know, they did a great job. It's subjective on you. <clears throat> it's what you think is right. It's what you think that the crew deserves. But, you know, I will say, you don't stiff these guys, especially when they've worked their butt off for you. I've, been, I've seen a couple of people that were that kind, and frankly, they, they deserve to be blackballed from the boat because they're wasting space. Yeah, you know, it's pretty self-centered. You know, at that point, if you get good service, tip them. You know, if you get bad service, let the skipper know. Tip accordingly. But I've been on these trips a lot, and I and I just wish I had more money to tip the guys. If I win a jackpot, <coughs> I might get a T-shirt or two for my kid or myself. The rest of it's going to the crew. And I know a lot of guys that just sign that over immediately, yeah, um, because. We're not going to catch these fish without the crew. You can see that on the videos, on what these guys will go through to make you successful and to so you'll have a great trip. You know, think about that. Budget for budget for the fish. You know, uh, for fish cleaning and or processing, seventy-five cents to a dollar a pound. Okay, and that's full fish weight, and you're going to lose thirty percent, forty percent, head, bones, whatever. <coughs> But you're going to have a few hundred bucks probably in, in fish processing. You may have parking, may have airfare, and you do have a tip. That's about it, guys. Now I'll check out and, and uh, shut up unless you digest. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this stuff is not hard. Get on the boat, enjoy it, put this on your bucket list for something to do this lifetime. You won't regret it. Uh, and you will, you will get that time back, okay? It's not going to take it off the top of your lifespan. This is something that recharges the batteries, makes you want to get back home and deal with people and go back to work or whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, it gives you a goal to look forward to each year. You know, it's, it's one of the good things about living, you know, one of the very good things. Thank you for your support. Thank you for watching. Thanks for shopping at Shark Bait. Yeah, it is much appreciated, you know, especially these times, any times. You know, we're a small business you know, with passion. Thank you. Bye-bye. Shark Bait.